Good evening, everybody. It is time for us to begin. Welcome to our midweek Bible study. Uh, we are currently studying in 1 Samuel. We got to the end of chapter 7, and we'll be devoting our time to studying from the Word. Uh, this is a, it's an open forum, so questions and comments are welcome. Um, the, chapter 7 wraps up the story about the ark where Israel's been at war with the Philistines and they've lost a battle. So they're asking themselves, all right, what went wrong? And they decide, well, what we need to do is bring the ark up. And the Philistines capture the ark and beat Israel even more badly than before um, and end up taking the ark back to their own cities where God afflicts them greatly, beginning by humiliating their idol Dagon and then he starts afflicting them with tumors and a plague of mice until eventually the Philistines are just sick of having the ark in their presence. They are, we give up. We're going to send this back. Um, and the ark returns. But what we learn in chapter 7 is that the ark wasn't really the problem to begin with. That Israel has spent 20 years lamenting after the Lord and they have continued to be oppressed by the Philistines. And so it finally comes out in chapter 7 what the real problem was, that they have been worshiping foreign gods, the Baals and the Ashtarot. And Samuel tells them, put away the foreign gods and the Ashtarot from among you, direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. And so chapter 7 here is bringing a lot of things to a close that we've seen since chapter 4. Now Israel is truly repenting, truly turning to the Lord. And on account of that, they are saved from the Philistines. So where we left off on Sunday is that the Philistines hear that they are all assembled at Mitzvah, and for whatever reason, the Philistines decide to attack them. Whereas in chapter 4, the, the, the Israelites had been arrayed for war. They were going out to battle. They were ready to fight, and they lost anyway. Here, they're gathered for repentance and worship. They are not ready for battle at all, but because they have truly turned to the Lord and have given up their idolatry, at least at this point, right, this isn't forever, but they've given it up at least for now, then the Lord saves them from the Philistines. Um, as uh, we read in verse 10, as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion, and they were defeated before Israel. And the men of Israel went out from Mitzvah and pursued the Philistines and struck them as far as below Betkar. All right, so that's where we finished off on Sunday. Um, all of these things that were started in chapter 4 are being brought to a close here in chapter 7, including a, a detail that we've not gotten to yet. In fact, it's probably going to be one of the first things that we see. So let's go ahead and pray together, and we will jump into our text. Righteous Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us with our time together this evening to study from your word. We pray, Father, that you make us receptive. Uh, we pray that our hearts may be open and willing to accept the, the lessons of your word Give us wisdom to discern what you mean through these stories, how we might apply them to our lives and be faithful in your sight. Thank you, Father, for blessing us in your Son, because we so often turn astray and go after our own paths and fall into sin. We are thankful that you sent him to live among us, that he gave himself as a perfect sacrifice uh, so that our sins could be forgiven through his blood. We are thankful for the hope of eternal life that we have in his resurrection and we, uh, e we eagerly await his return, Father, for we know that he is at your right hand at this very moment. It's in his name that we offer our prayer this evening. Amen. All right, uh, let's start in verse 12, and we'll finish up chapter 7. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mitzvah and Shen, and called its name Ebenezer. For he said, Till now the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. 
The cities that the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, from Ekron to Gath, and Israel delivered their territory from the hand of the Philistines. There was peace also between Israel and the Amorites. Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life, and he went on a circuit year by year to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mitzvah, and he judged Israel in all these places. Then he would return to Ramah, for his home was there, and there also he judged Israel, and he built there an altar to the Lord. All right, so the chapter ends um, with some notes basically about tranquility, peace in Israel. It starts with this memorial stone that Samuel sets up that he names Ebenezer. Um, and there's another tie-in here with what we had read back in chapter 4. If you go back to the beginning of chapter 4, in verse 1, Right, and the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. They encamped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped at Aphek. Now Ebenezer and Mitzpah are two different places. Right, The memorial stone that Samuel is setting up at Mitzpah is not in the city of Ebenezer. Um, but the name is a reminder to us right, that all of this has come around full circle, as it were. Um, and it also helps us to, know, looking back at the story, Israel has encamped at this place, Ebenezer, which Samuel tells us signifies, till now the Lord has helped us. And you'll remember in chapter 4, they lose, and the elders are asking in verse 3, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Why hasn't the Lord been helping us? Right? It's a... You know, the, signal that something is not right in that situation. Well, now it's come around full circle. Uh, the crisis of their idolatry has been resolved, at least for now. Um, and now they do have the Lord's presence and they do have the Lord's help. Um, we're told that Samuel judges Israel, which puts him in the same category, the same class of people as all of those men that we read about in the book of Judges. Uh, that we studied not too long ago. Um, you know, Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, uh, Gideon, Jephthah, Samson, all the rest. Samuel is the last of that class of men. Uh, and it's the same word that's used to describe him, not just in English, but also in Hebrew. Uh, he judged Israel all the days of his life. Now, he's clearly a different sort of judge than the ones who came before him. He is not the warlord of days past, right? You remember all of the men that we read about in Judges are, are warlords, right? They go out and they fight. Um, Samuel is different. He is a prophet and a priest who calls Israel to repentance and leads them in sacrifice and in prayer. He prays on behalf of the people, offers sacrifice on behalf of the people. In Samuel we should see the ideal form of the judge. Right? As we went through the book of Judges, we noted how all of those men are deeply flawed. Right? Guys like Gideon, who starts off promising, you know, he's tearing down his father's Baal altar, and he's hewing down his father's Asherah, you know, getting rid of these idols. By the end of his time, he himself has built an idol. Right? Or Jephthah, who, sure, he delivers Israel. You know, the spirit of the Lord rushes on him, and he fights against Israel's enemies. But at the end of his story, he sacrifices his own daughter. Um, you know, deeply, deeply flawed men. Samuel you know, is the ideal form of the judge. He's doing things that we wish that the other judges would have done, in you know, leading in prayer and in sacrifice. And what we've read here at the end of 1 Samuel 7 is that the land enjoys rest, in a sense, and in basically the same way that the land enjoyed rest during the time of the judges, all the days of Samuel's life. Right At the very least, the hand of the Lord is against the Philistines during all that time, and so the story of the ark is brought to a close. But all of this prepares us for what is about to come. 
because things are about to change starting in chapter 8 as we enter into the next major section of the book. We should note what state Israel is in. Right? Israel ends this part of the book in complete tranquility. They are victorious over the Philistines. They are, they've regained territory from the Philistines. They are at peace with their neighbors. And why do they, I mean, this is, should be kind of an obvious answer, but why do they enjoy all of this success? Is it their own doing? I mean, pretty obviously not. Right? The whole point of the story is that it's God. Yeah, they've repented. Yes, they've repented. They've gone back. And God is taking care of them exactly the way that he has promised all along. That if they turn to him, that he will fight the battles for them and provide for them. And when we read this last little bit of chapter 7, is there anything that Israel lacks? I mean, they're just, again, completely at peace. Peace in the fullest sense. We're not reading about... Besides war, we don't read about any kind of famine or drought or anything. I mean, this, is, this is ideal existence in Israel at this time. Right? This is important for entering into chapter 8 because of what we are about to see. All right, uh, any questions or comments on that last bit of chapter 7 before we jump into chapter 8? Wayne? Uh-huh. Yes, you're reading a passage like this, it is like you're waiting for the other shoe to drop, isn't it? Yes, yes. Very good. Yeah, we know Israel well enough by now, yeah, that whenever we read of an idyllic scene like this, we're waiting for it to end. <laughs> yeah, we're anticipating the change. All right, good. Anything else before we continue on? All right, chapter 8. Um, let's, actually, we'll just read the first three verses, briefly comment, and then jump into the rest. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second son, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. All right, so as we're entering into this next major section of the book, some time has gone by after the deliverance from the Philistines, and this chapter opens with some dispiriting news. Um, that as Samuel has grown old, his sons have grown crooked. And of course, who does this remind us of? Yeah, Eli and his sons, Hophni and Phinehas. All right, that was a big, big point in the very first part of the book. Uh, Eli, the priest, has these two crooked sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And, of course, what ultimately happens to Eli? Yeah, I mean, Hophni and Phinehas themselves die, and Eli dies. And what does, Eli, what does Eli's house suffer on account of these crooked sons of his? Yes. His priestly status was being removed. Again, not just Eli, but his entire house is going to be removed from the priesthood. Um, and insofar as there's going to be any of them left at all, God says there's going to be, you know, you'll always have one descendant left to your house so that he can, you know, cry and weep and wail. Right? It's, uh, yeah, it, it does strike you as... Um, I don't, I don't want to say vindictive. That's, we don't want to attribute that to God. But it is, it's funny reading that, right? That you've got this one guy who's left behind specifically for the purpose of crying all the time um, to give us a fuller sense of the punishment that is being meted out on Eli's house for that failure. And now we read that Samuel has went and gone the exact same way. Um, and it's, it's tragic to see we also should remember that who raised Samuel? Eli did. Um, we should remember that. But the text has given us this vivid reminder of Hophni and Phinehas 
and the house of Eli by telling us that these two sons, Joel and Abijah, are crooked. They took bribes. They perverted justice. They turned aside after gain. I want us to, to keep, since we the, the text has put Hophni and Phinehas in our minds, I want us to keep them in our minds as we read the rest of the story in chapter 8. All right, uh, we'll pick up again in verse 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice, make them a king. And Samuel then said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. All right, and so there's some disagreement among commentators about Samuel's choice to make his sons judges after him uh, in just in the first place. The text doesn't comment on this one way or the other, uh, so it's best not to make too much of it. But, um, well, some commentators say that in this ancient context where everything is passed down from father to son, it really shouldn't shock us to see something like this where he appoints his sons to be judges after him. But... Uh, we should also remember the, the precedents that we've had from all of the other judges. Have we ever seen a judge pass that mantle down to his son before? No. The closest that we've gotten was Abimelech. Y'all remember Abimelech? Uh, now, unless I'm forgetting somebody. Um, Abimelech, the son of Gideon. Remember this story. The, after Gideon saved Israel, um, Israel came to Gideon and tried to make him king. And remember Gideon's response. I'm not going to be king over you. God shall be king over you. And we made a big deal talking about this, that it sounds like a nice and pious response until he has a son with this Canaanite woman in Shechem, and he names his son Abimelech, which y'all remember what that means? Now remember, it re means my dad is king, right? And so Gideon, again, he's, he's made all this talk about, I'm not going to be king over you. And then he names his son, my dad is king. And he's been living like a king. Um, and what does Abimelech do? He turns around and tries to make himself king. The people of Shechem anoint him king. 
And he goes on a tear through the northern part of Israel for a while uh, until uh, some unnamed woman, uh, some blessed woman, drops a millstone on his head and puts an end to his campaign. Um, but that's, that's really the most precedent that we have in the Old Testament for a judge trying to... Well, Gideon doesn't even try to make Abimelech a judge after him. Abimelech just... Uh, assumes this power for himself. But so far, that's been all the commentary that we've had on the sons of judges who try to take up power for themselves. We have never seen a dynasty among the judges up to this point. Instead, in the book of Judges, how are the judges picked? Yeah, by God directly. Right? God pours his spirit out on somebody. Um, and that is, that's how it normally happens. Um, now, it may be that this intolerable situation with Joel and Abijah is supposed to foreshadow the coming monarchy, because monarchy is dynastic, right? The, it, the judges were what we would call charismatic, meaning they received a gift from God. Um, that's, that's the meaning of charismatic. Somebody who's appointed through a direct spiritual gift from God. That's how a judge becomes a judge. Um, but monarchy is dynastic, meaning that it's passed down from father to son. And here's the thing. If the king's sons turn out badly, well, that's bad news for you because he's your next king. <laughs> right? So... Perhaps we find that being foreshadowed here in Joel and Abijah, where Samuel is trying to take the, the mantle of judge and turn it into a dynasty that he, uh, that he um, sends down to his sons. But all of this is what makes the elders' request ironic. Right? Because the elders of Israel come together to Samuel at his home in Ramah and complain to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. All right, so they come to Samuel. They point out that he's nearly at the end of his life. His sons are corrupt. And so, and he's made them uh, his successors. And they don't want corrupt judges. And so then they turn around and ask for a king. And you have to wonder, what kind of system do they think they're going to get? Right? If, they, if they have a problem with Samuel passing down the judgeship to his sons, even though they are crooked, well, what do they think is going to happen whenever a king is in power and his sons become corrupt? Right? They are going to be locking in exactly the sort of thing that they are complaining about. And so you wonder why they're asking for this, if that's really the problem that they have. right? If the, if the real problem is Samuel's sons are corrupt, why are they asking for a system that is going to encourage exactly the same kind of corruption? It's fairly obvious that their complaint is a pretext for asking for something that they want regardless of the situation. And we're going to get into that. Uh, that the elders of Israel are not asking for this in good faith. Because, look, asking for a king is not the only or even the first thing that might come to mind as a solution for having corrupt leaders. Um, because, well, what has God done with, in the past? What did he do with Hophni and Phinehas? He killed them. And he removed them from power. Right? These were men in power, uh, who had inherited their power, by the way. Um, but they were men in power who became corrupt, and God killed them, removed them from power, uh, and promised to replace them with more faithful priests. And we've seen God do that with other people at other times. When someone becomes corrupt, God removes them from power, um, and bring someone else in. Now, that could also be the case here, right? Assuming that Samuel doesn't get his sons in line, 
Israel should be able to trust that God will fix the problem, right? That God will remove them, that God will give them better judges. But instead, notice that they they are making a logical leap here, right? It's it's like um, if you've ever had a little kid ask you for something and they try to come up with a reason for why they should have it, like a toy or chocolate or something. Now, my feelings are hurt. I was sad about this thing. I need a new toy. It's like, wait a minute. How did we get from A to B here? <laughs> it, it, the elders are doing exactly the same thing. Your sons are corrupt. Give us a king. Like, wait a minute. There's, there's a whole lot of logic in the middle between your premise and your conclusion that, like, this does not lead to that. Why does Samuel's sons being corrupt lead to give us a king? It, it doesn't. There's not really a connection for it. Um, they've made a jump by asking for a king. Now, we'll talk about why Israel wants a king in just a minute. But we should start by establishing that it is not a sin generally for Israel to request a king. Right, now, we should, again, we're saying here they're asking for it in bad faith. And God is very clear to them that they are going to regret this decision. They are going to get more than what they bargained for. Um, but I think sometimes we approach this passage and say that Israel's sin is that they asked for a king. And specifically that they asked for a king um, so that we can be like all the nations. Um, and that that's the nature of their sin. I want us to go back to the law of Moses. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Yes, there is there is some yeah, there is some element to that. Yeah, that they're not su saying do this so that we can be like everybody else. Uh, does go against the, the general ethos of who they're supposed to be. Yeah, they are supposed to be a different, set-apart people. Um, and we see in our reading that one of the things that they're doing is that they are rejecting God as king. I want us to note something that Israel had already received from Moses. Deuteronomy 17, verse 14. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. Notice this is framed in exactly the same terms. I'll set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. What's the next verse say? You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as, as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom... He shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Le Levitical priests. And it shall be with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. All right, now there are a lot of conditions, a lot of stipulations put to this, right? Can't be a foreigner, has to be somebody, you know, native Israelite, um, has to be, as a king, not acquisitive, meaning you're not gathering up lots of horses, um, and you're not gathering up lots of wives. Um, he has to maintain a copy of the law, and he has to have it read to him, constantly, like he's got to be in the book all the time. But with all of these stipulations, what does the law say about Israel having a king? 
Yeah, it's all right. You may indeed set a king over you. Uh, the other, the big, big, big stipulation is it is a king whom the Lord your God will choose. Right? God is going to do the appointing. Now, we'll see if that, if, well, we will see in Samuel that that happens. God appoints the kings that we read about in the books of Samuel. Um, they are at least faithful in that regard. We'll see if the kings are faithful in any of the other regards. Right? You, and you know some of these stories already. Uh, maybe some names would come to mind whenever we talk about kings who acquire lots of horses and especially kings who acquire lots of wives. Who do you, who, well, you, you wanted to say something, Cindy? They are going to do, yes. And there's definitely something to that. Yes. Yeah, we're, we are already given... It's as if here at the very outset, God is telling Israel through Samuel, this project is doomed to failure. Now, why and in what way it's doomed to failure, we're going to see in just a minute, Lord willing. Um, but I want us to make sure we've got this point established that Israel is not sinning by asking for a king. It's some of the other specific things that they are doing that makes this a sin for them, that makes this a bad faith request from them. Sorry? Yeah, there's... Yeah, we are, we are definitely going to see that some of that is going on. Um, they have some particular things in mind, and God is telling them they are not going to get those things. Um, let's see. So, kind of jumped ahead of my notes here. Oh, one other thing we should remember. All right, so not only does the law approve and say that Israel can have a king, but we need to remember Hannah's prayer. All right, I said we would keep returning to this prayer. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, <clears throat> remember how the prayer concludes. And I think we made a note of this whenever we studied the prayer. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 10, The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. We've seen... Both parts of that fulfilled already in the story. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Right. So already the book of Samuel itself has spoken with approval of the idea of Israel having a king. Right. All of this assumes that Israel is going to have a king. Um, we should notice, though, by the way, that Hannah's prayer recognizes that God ultimately is the judge. He is the strength behind the throne, but he's also the judge. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. And that brings us to what is wrong with Israel's request. It is not a sin to ask for a king, but Israel's request for a king does happen in the context of their sinfulness. And they have sinful motives for wanting a king. They have sinful intentions for the monarchy. Right? The loyalty that Israel should give to God alone, they will instead give to their king. We're going to see this play out in a couple of ways, but we should understand this as a form of idolatry. That Israel is going to be putting the monarchy in the place of God. Right? It's not idolatry in the conventional sense of having a graven image, although we'll see with some later kings it, it more or less turns into that. Uh, it, it was not at all uncommon in antiquity uh, for the ancients to worship their kings as sons of God. Um, in fact, that's part of what's so uh, provocative about Jesus in the New Testament coming along claiming to be the son of God because you know who else claimed to be the son of God? Caesar did. Like it's on Roman coinage. You know, in, inscriptions you know, with it depicting Caesar on the coin with an inscription around it, son of God. Very, very common thing in antiquity. Um, 
But anyway, coming back to this, we should, we're going to see in a couple of ways, just from what is presented in this text, uh, that Israel is going to be putting their king in the place of God. Um, the first is in the, the first way in which we see this play out is in the matter of judgment and justice. Israel, the, the elders of Israel, first ask, for a king to judge us. We should note, by the way, that specifically is what makes Samuel mad. All right, in verse 5, right, Behold, you are old, your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. Right, we tend to focus on the king like all the nations part, but look at what Samuel focuses on. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. That's what makes Samuel mad, that they've said, give us a king to judge us. You'll see why that angers Samuel in just a second. Um, having a king is not going to save Israel from the pattern of oppression that we find in the book of the Judges. And this is, we should understand it in this context. Uh, that's the thrust of the Lord's message that he delivers through Samuel. Right? Remember, Samuel prays to the Lord, and the Lord tells Samuel, all right, listen to them, give them a king. They're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. They've always rejected me. But in verse 9, he says, Now then, obey their voice, only you, you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Now, the sense of this message, I think, would come across a little more clearly to us um, if we translated it, show them the king's justice. Because the Hebrew word uh, that's used there for the ways of the king, is it's the Hebrew word for judgment or justice. And I cannot for the life of me figure out why all of our English translations do this thing where they talk about the matters of the king or the ways of the king. Because, yeah, just general, his general behavior. Because it erases or it obscures for us, reading this in English, um, this wordplay that's going on between judge and justice and judgment. They want a king to judge them. Right? In English, right, we recognize that there's a connection between a judge, like the person who's doing the judging, and the concepts of justice and judgment. All of those share the same root in English. It's exactly the same way in Hebrew. Uh, they, they use exactly the same root to talk about judges and to talk about judgment and to talk about justice. And that runs all through what Samuel says in 1 Samuel 8. Here's what's going on. Israel is asking for a king to judge them. In other words, they want the king to replace the judge. Now, who's, who's the judge in this case? Well, ultimately, God, it's Samuel. Yeah, Remember, we just read at the end of chapter 7 that Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And it's the same word, by the way, uh, that's being used here in chapter 8. Samuel is the judge. And now I think perhaps we get a sense of why Samuel is angry at that in particular. They, they've just asked Samuel, please replace yourself. <laughs> We want a king to do your job instead of you. Um, but they've, they have brought this complaint because Samuel's sons are corrupt. They are unjust. And they think that having a king is going to give them justice because they have forgotten who the ultimate source of justice is. But by seeking the king's justice... They are, in fact, rejecting God's justice inasmuch as they are rejecting God himself, which is what God tells Samuel. Right? They're rejecting me. They're not rejecting you. And so God tells Samuel, go ahead and give Israel a king, but you tell them what the king's justice is going to be. 
And so Samuel tells them. In, start in verse 11. He said, this will be the king's justice. Right? These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. This is going to be the king's justice who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots to be, and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipments of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He'll take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. Now, well, go ahead, Wayne. No, no, go ahead. Uh huh. Yes. You know, yeah, equity. Fairness. Yeah. Yes. Yes, and we need to remember this. Remember that from the book of Judges. The, the judges are all about saving Israel from the oppression of other peoples. That's what a judge does, because the lifting off of oppression is justice. Right? If there's oppression, there's no justice. Reestablishing justice in the land means lifting off oppression. What are they going to get from a king? They're getting oppression. They're not getting justice. Right? So whenever we say, this will be the king's justice that will reign over you, we've got to put justice in quotation marks. Right? It's meant to be understood sarcastically. Right? You want the king to be a judge over you? Well, let's see what the king's justice is going to look like. It looks like a king taking a tenth of everything you own on top of the tithe that you're already giving to the priests. And he's going to take the best of your fields. He's going to take the best of your servants. He's going to take your kids. He's going to take some of everything. Remember also that the people have complained about Joel and Abijah because they turned aside after gain. That's what the text tells us at the beginning of the chapter. God warns that the king is going to do just that on a national scale, right? So ironically, this king that Israel wants to judge them, to give them justice, this king is going to become the oppressor that Israel will cry out for deliverance from. Think about all through the book of Judges, all the times that Israel cries out for deliverance from the Canaanites, the Moabites, the Edomites, the Philistines, all these times they cry out. God tells them through Samuel, the last judge, you're going to cry out again, but it's going to be on account of your own king whom you chose. And because of that, God says, I'm not going to answer you. Yeah. So let's wrap this up. We're pretty much out of time. After Samuel tells Israel of the king's justice, look at Israel's response in verse 19. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. They said, no. Right? Their, their response is a non-response. Right? Their, their, their response is simply to refuse to obey. First word out of their mouth is no. They don't answer any of the things that the Lord had Samuel say. They simply contradict him. And this is ironic because remember, their initial complaint is about Joel and Abijah being corrupt. This puts us in mind of Hophni and Phinehas, who were also corrupt. How did Hophni and Phinehas respond whenever Eli tried to correct them? They didn't listen to him. So now who's like Hophni and Phinehas? 
not just Joel and Abijah, it's all Israel now. Now Israel itself is acting like Hophni and Phinehas. We should also remember Israel's failure in chapter 4. When they were defeated before the Philistines, there's no prayer. There's no theological consideration. They simply come up with an idea and run with it. And now they're doing it again. They've come up with an idea and they are running with it. We should note, by the way, Samuel has prayed. He is acting faithfully, but the rest of Israel is not. And Israel's contradiction adds to their rejection of God as king. Because notice they have expanded their expectations of the king. Now it's not just there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us. But now they've added this last bit at the end of verse 20. And go out before us and fight our battles. Now that last bit is especially unfaithful because in the scriptures, who do we read leads Israel in war? God himself does. And we just saw it in chapter 7. And they're not arrayed for battle or anything. Samuel's not leading them out into war as a general. He's praying and making sacrifices. And it's God who leads them out. They saw that. And yet here they are saying, we want a king to lead us out into battle. And it gives us, again, this is the, the other sense in which they have rejected God as king. God was the one leading them. Now they want a human king to do it. So I guess the, what, the last thing that we're left with is that the Lord tells Samuel, obey their voice, make them a king. And this is the second time he's told Samuel this, by the way. If Israel is wrong to ask for a king in this way, well, why does God tell Samuel to do what they say? The short answer to this, because I know we're already quite a bit over time, the answer to this that we read elsewhere in Scripture is that God sometimes gives people over to their evil desires. Or think about Romans 1. So the chapter ends with Samuel dismissing the people back to their homes, presumably to make preparations or to await the word of the Lord regarding what to do next. So thank you so much for your kind attention, your questions and comments this evening. Lord willing, on Sunday we will hit chapter 9.